Hello and welcome back to another VMK in the C++ series. In this VMK I'm going to formally describe the different data types that C++ supports. So we're going to discuss the integer, the floating point, uh, regular structures, as well as unions. Uh, these all will come in handy when you're working with uh, any sort of program in C++. So let's just jump right into uh, Visual Studio and take a look. We're going to create a new project. Uh, it's going to be a Win32 console project, and I'll call this a union because that's actually uh, where we're going to finish off this video tutorial. Um, in under application settings, we have console application selected, and we have our basic main program here. Now, if you're following along with the previous VMKs, you've already seen me use floating point numbers and uh, decimal integers, but this time I'm actually going to describe to you how these guys work. So Starting off with the integer data type, we can have something like this, i value, and I can set this guy up to be equal to any kind of integer. So I could say 4, for instance, and this variable now is actually set to the value 4, which we've already seen before I could go and display to the screen by using percent %d uh, slash n to give us a carriage return at the end, and then I can specify here my value that I want to display. If I go and build this guy with Control F5 and run it, we can see we have 4 being displayed on the screen. This is great. But now notice something interesting. This is an integer data type, but I can actually type in a floating point number into here. For instance, 5.99. That's a floating point number because it has a decimal component that makes this value not an integer. Notice what happens when I compile the program. It compiles and gives me succeeded, however, if we take a look here, there was a warning issued, and the warning says conversion from double to integer, possible loss of data. Let's actually see what happens when we run our program. We see that the output is not getting rounded, it's actually just displaying the integer part, which is 5. So the .99 part here is getting clipped out completely by the compiler, and that's what it was meant whenever it said possible loss of data. There is no rounding involved, and the reason why it said that it's taking a double and converting it to a integer is because this value here is actually represented as a double inside of our uh, compiled code. The only time this is displayed as a floating point number is if we type in an F at the very end. You'll notice now when I compile the code and scroll up, it says conversion from a floating point number to an integer. So this little F here tells uh, the compiler that the number before the F is a floating point number. If I take that out, then it's a double. Now you may be asking yourself, what's a float and what's a double? Well, both of these are actually floating point numbers but the precision or the number of bytes that uh, the compiler uses to represent these numbers is different. A floating point number uses 4 bytes, whereas a double uses 8 bytes. So a double is actually a number that can be larger in size, but it also has more precision. It has more decimal points that you can represent a number with using a double. Uh, if you're not very interested in high precision uh, calculations, feel free to use floats because they use less memory. Uh, they're only four bytes wide. Okay, so that's an integer data type. You've seen that already. Now let's talk about floating point numbers. I can define a floating point number using the float keyword, and I'll type in here my new variable, f value. And to define a f value, you've seen this already, so I can just type in, for instance, 0.8f. And if I go and compile this, uh, compiles fine, oh, and if we want to display it onto the screen, we'd use printf, and this time we need to use not d here, because d is exclusive for displaying decimal numbers, what we want to display is a floating point number. So we're going to type in f here, and again we need to specify our floating point value, like so. So now on the screen we have 5, and then we have 0 0.80000 all the way to down to the end. You'll notice that sometimes these numbers here at the very end get uh, a little bit different than what you've actually set them to. You may see this popping up like a little 1 over here in the far decimal point or things like that. If we change this guy to be a double, I can do so like this, and we'll get rid of the F there. 
And now when we run the program, you notice it still displays the same thing, but again, this guy is now taking up twice as much room in memory than a floating point number. If you don't want to be seeing all those extra zeros at the end, what you can do is type in a couple numbers in front of your F, but after the percent sign. So for instance, if I do this, 1.1, that tells the compiler that the output that we want to see is going to have one or more values in front of the decimal point, but then after the decimal point, I only want to have one value or one decimal. So now notice that when I do this, our 0 0.80000 gets clipped to just 0 0.8. Another very useful data type is the Boolean. And the Boolean data type, oh, wait a minute, before I go on any further, I just want to emphasize one more thing here. When you're working with integers and floating point numbers or doubles, let me just put this back to be a floating point number because it's more common. Whenever you're using floating point numbers and decimal point numbers, make sure you don't ma mismatch your D and your uh, F here. Let me show you what happens if I do mismatch them. Your program does run and it does output something, but notice that my 5 value here for the integer does not display as 5, it actually displays 0 here. And my floating point number, which I've specified to be 0.8, displays at some very large negative number. So what the compiler is trying to do is interpret these numbers as being decimal numbers or floating point numbers, even though they're not, and that's why you're getting this uh, obscure output. So if you are seeing this sort of thing, make sure you, that you are using the correct flag here to indicate what kind of data type you're trying to output to the screen. All right, so let's move on to the Boolean data type. Boolean is defined by the bool keyword, so you have B-O-O-L, and the Boolean data type is either true or false. So the way you define it is by the keyword true or the keyword false. Now, if you actually want to display this out to the screen, uh, there isn't a fprint bool type uh, that you can just type in here. Like, there isn't a percent uh, %b for bool. That doesn't work. So what you instead could do is convert your bool uh, value into an integer and then display it as an integer. You'll remember, d was to display integers to the screen. The way you can do that is you can cast numbers. So if I cast our Boolean to an integer, what we can do is type in the word int in brackets like so, and then right beside it, type in your variable that you want to cast to be an integer. So now, when we run this, you can see that our BOK value outputs 1, and 1 is the equivalent of true. If I change this to false, we should see 0 being displayed onto the screen. You can do this also with floating point numbers and decimal numbers. So if we had a floating point number like so, and I set this guy up to be, I don't know, 3.14, if I wanted to display this floating point number as a decimal, then we'd cast it to an integer, and here we'd specify f value. So now you can see it's displaying 3. Now, when we're casting, remember, it's doing a type cast, not a rounding operation. So if we type in f value is equal to 3.8, and we do this, we're still only getting 3 as an output. We're not rounding this up to be 4. Okay, so those are sort of the numeric and the Boolean data types. We also have uh, character string types inside of C++. And the way we use those is as follows. We have the keyword char, which defines to us a character data type. And we can define it as a, any other, we can define it the same way we do any other data type, and we can give it a number. So let's say we give c equal to 65. To display a character data type inside of the printf function, we use percent %c. And we can just pass in here our uh, character type. Well, let me rename our variable C um, variable, just so it's a little bit more clear as to what's a variable and what's just a keyword. Okay, so let's go and build this and see what happens. 
Notice that the output is A. I typed in 65, but I got the output as A. Hmm. Let's change this to 90, maybe. If I go and run this, we get an output of, looks like Z. What's going on here? Well, the character data type is a one-byte value, and the value is interpreted as ASCII text. So these numbers that I'm typing in here are ASCII values that are getting converted to a character string that's getting printed to the screen. If you're not familiar with ASCII uh, values, you can go to ASCIItable.com and take a look at the ASCII table. You can see here that the decimal value for 65 is actually the letter A, and the decimal value for 90 is the letter Z. So that's why we're getting Z displayed on the screen if we're setting our value to be 90. And as a matter of fact, we can go back here and type in a letter in here. So let's say the small letter G in single quotes. And what this is going to do is it's going to take the ASCII value for G and save it inside of our character variable so that when we run it and display it to the screen, we actually are seeing the letter G on the screen. Now, don't get confused here and use double quotes. If you try this, uh, the compiler will actually complain to you, I do believe, yeah, uh, saying that cannot convert from constant char 2 to uh, a char data type. So this is invalid because double quotes is actually used for something different in C++. Single quotes is used for character data types. So that's how you'd save uh, one individual ASCII letter to a variable using the char data type. I'm going to come back to this in a little bit when we talk about strings, but first I want to talk about arrays. Arrays are data types or data variables that store more than one value inside of their variable. So let me demonstrate this as an integer array. I can have an integer array that holds three values that's defined like so. So again, I'm using the int keyword, and this time my variable name is i3val, and I'm saying I want to define this guy to be an array of three values. So I'm using the square brackets, I'm specifying I want to have three values, and then I close the square brackets. To use this variable, it's very easy. You just type in i3val, and then you need to specify which value you want to work with. So the first one inside of the array is index 0. This is very important. If you're using 3 here, then you're going to have numbers from 0, 1, and 2. You won't actually have a variable called uh, i3val bracket 3. That's an invalid number. You're starting from index 0, and you're working up to the maximum number minus 1. So if I'm going to define the first guy here to be some value, I would do the following. And if I wanted to have the second value equal to something, then I would do something like this. And then my last value inside of the array would be defined like this. I'm just typing in some random numbers here. So that's how you define uh, your values inside of your array. And as a matter of fact, when you're using arrays, it's sometimes handy to uh, use for loops because your for loop, you can iterate through your array one at a time and define your values very quickly. And I'll show you this in a second. But first, let's output the values here that I dis just defined inside of this array. It's going to be the exact same thing that we've done before. Um, so what we're going to do here is percent %d with some spaces in between. And the three values we want to display is i3val0. And I'm just going to cut and paste this code here so that we can type in 2 and 1. Oh, I missed something here. I, oh, it's supposed to be i3 value. So there we go, we have 1, minus 23, and 457. So that's the way you'd save values inside of an array, and this is how you'd retrieve values from an array. And again, if you wanted to do this inside of a for loop, what you would do most likely is something like this. i equals 0, i less than 3, i plus plus. And then inside here, you'd do i3 val. You want to index each array value. So this i value is my uh, variable that's going to be changing from 0 all the way up to 2 because it's 
as soon as 2 is less than 3, it's going to execute. But then once we increment, it's going to be 3, not less than 3, so it's just going to exit. And I just set this up to be i times, I don't know, 10 maybe. So there we go. We go 0, 10, and 20. So that's the way you would use a for loop to save different values inside of your array, uh, indexing based on the value that's inside of this for loop. Now let's go back to characters. You remember before, what we did is we used the character keyword, char, to define our uh, data variable c. And C was going to store one uh, ASCII letter. But what if you wanted to store something longer, like a, a string? Well, what you can do is define a array of uh, character types. And you usually define these uh, like so. So what I've done here is I've said, I'm going to create a variable called string. And it's going to be able to hold up to 100 characters uh, in length. So it's going to be able to hold 100 letters, basically. Now, you may wonder, well, does this really mean that I have to go like this? F string 0 is equal to my first letter. I don't know. Maybe I want to type in uh, Matic nose. So if that's the case, would I do this? M A R E and so on and so forth, and for each of these you have to increment. Well, you could do that. It would take you a really long time to write out your program, so in C++ there's actually an easier way to handle this. Instead of doing all of this work by hand, like so, what you can do is call sprintf, which is a special function that lets you type in your variable name that you want to be dumping in your string of text into, and then you can specify as your second parameter what it is you want to put into that string. And here, maybe I'm going to type in my website. So what this is going to do is it's going to take this string of text, and notice it's in double quotes now, not single quotes, and it's putting it all inside of my variable here. If I want to display that to the screen, instead of using percent %d or percent %f, to display a string, you use percent %s. You'll remember before, when we had just one character, we used percent %c. So there is a distinction here. Percent %s is a string of text. And as a variable that we're passing in here, you're going to pass in sz string. You're not going to indicate which uh, array uh, index you want to use. You're just specifying your variable name. Now when we run this, you can see the output to the screen is the entire string. There is one thing that you need to be careful with when you're using this uh, function here. And that is, there is no compiler checking for you to make sure that whatever you have over here is actually going to fit inside of your string. So let me demonstrate this. Let's say our array is only 10 characters long. Well, if I do this, you'll notice that I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and then a whole bunch of other characters left over. So I'm trying to put a string that's larger than 10 characters into a string that I've defined to only have 10 characters long. What's going to happen? Well, we can run this, and you notice that the program actually crashes. Uh, it's doing this because we're writing into memory locations that are not accessible to us. So to make sure that this never happens, what you can do is instead use snprintf. And what this function does is it says, OK, which variable do you want to be putting stuff into? But as a second parameter, you can define exactly what's the maximum number of characters that you're allowed to write into it. And you should always write in one less than the maximum amount here. And the reason for that is all your strings that you're working with have to be null terminated. If they're not null terminated, then you will not be able to display them to the screen properly. And to to null terminate a string, what you need to do is the following. Set the very last value of a string equal to 0. And again, remember, because we have an array of 10 values here, our maximum value is 10 minus 1, which is 9. So now when we do this and run our program, 
we can see our program does not crash. And as a matter of fact, it clips our output into this variable based on the value that we specified here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine characters on the screen, and the tenth one is our null character. If we don't add this tenth one in here, look what happens. We have our correct nine here, but then we have garbage on the screen. And that garbage is actually what is being displayed onto the screen because printf is expecting to have a null terminated string when you pass in percent %s here with some variable. So make sure you have null terminated strings. You don't have to worry about terminating strings if you're using uh, sprintf because automatically it terminates your strings for you uh, whenever it does the copying over. So it'll copy this value here plus the next one over was going to be null terminated for you. So you don't have to do the null terminating when you're using S, uh, sprintf. But you do have to do it if you're using uh, underscore snprintf. Let's say now that you want to create a variable that doesn't hold just one value, but rather holds a grouping of values. I've shown you how to create integers, decimals, booleans, characters, character strings. But let's say you wanted to create a variable something like a player. And a player may have things like uh, its location, x, y, z. It may have like um, life, so it has some sort of number there. It may have a Boolean number that says whether um, it's alive or not, things like that. You want to be able to group different kinds of data variables together into one structure so that you can use them together. All of them uh, sort of mean something useful. The way you do this in C++ is by using a structure. And to do this, you'd use the keyword struct. And the second parameter inside of here, you'd say, what is it that you want to call the structure? So my name for the structure is going to be player. The structure you then define to have different kinds of data types inside. So maybe I'll have uh, be alive. This is the Boolean that says whether this player is alive or not. Maybe the player can hold ammo, so I'm going to have another variable, which is an integer, that's going to contain how much ammo does this player have. And then maybe I'll have fx, um, fy, and fz. So these are the x, y, and z coordinates of our player. So these are all the different kinds of data types that player is going to have. Now notice that the definition of structure has a semicolon after the closing brace here. This is very important. If you don't put this in, your compiler will complain. Actually, I can show you that very quickly by doing this. If I try to compile this now, you notice that it fails and it gives me an obscure warning or actually an obscure error saying player followed by int is illegal. Did you forget a semicolon? Oh, well, actually, um, it is kind of helpful. It says you're missing a semicolon. So put that semicolon in, and then when you compile it, um, Oh, it says undeclared string because I'm trying to print something here. So let's just comment that out. And you notice now it succeeds. So this is how you define a structure. To use a structure, you use it as any other different kind of data type I've showed you so far. I've called it player. So the structure itself is going to be defined as a player. And then you want to say, what is your uh, name of your variable that you want to use? Well, I'm going to be using player as a data type. The name of the variable could be anything, so I'm just going to call him Joe. Joe is a player, so this is the way it's defined, and I can then access each of these different variables inside of the player structure by using the point on the keyboard. So as soon as I type that, you see all the different types showing up on the screen here. So I can say be alive is equal to true. I can do joe.fx is equal to 2.3, well, don't forget to change that to be a floating point number. Joe FY is equal to 0, maybe. Joe FZ is equal to minus some number. And finally, we have Joe.IAMO, and let's give him 100 bullets. So this is the way you'd uh, define your values for your variables that are part of a structure. And to display them to the screen, you do a similar thing that we've done before. This time, we're going to display uh, maybe a string to the screen here, Joe. 
and then we want to say whether he has some ammo or not. So that's going to be a string that I'm going to display. So S is going to be my keyword here. Let's put a carriage return at the end here. And then what do I want to show? I want to show his X, Y, and Z position. So position, these are all floating point numbers. So let's go and round them off to two decimal points. We have X, we have Y, and we have Z. And we're going to do a carriage return again. Then the last thing is ammo. So let's type in ammo here. And ammo is an integer, so we're going to use percent %d. And to pass in our parameters, we're just going to do the following. In here, we're going to type out a string. So depending on the value of joe.bealive, if it's true, then we're going to say he's alive. Otherwise, we're going to type in uh, dead. And then we had joe.fx, joe.fy, joe.fz, and then the last thing was joe's ammo. So let's take a look at this. We have he's alive, his position, and then how much ammo he has. If we change this to be false, and we rerun this, we see Joe is dead, and there's his position with how much ammo he had. So pretty simple. Just remember, structures are used to group different kinds of data types together. OK, let's wrap things up for this video with a union. Let's say you wanted to create a structure that is going to represent a vector. We all know a vector is comprised of different components, so, so let's say that our vector is going to be three-dimensional. We're going to have fx, fy, and fz. Like so. So again, we can define our vector here. Let's just call it v for simplicity. And we can define f dot fx is equal to 1, v dot fy is equal to 2, and v dot fz is equal to 3. And just quickly here, let's go and print that stuff out to the screen. v.fx, v.fy, and v.fz. Oh, I must have missed something here. Oh, I missed my semicolon. Let's try that again. OK, one, two, and three. Unions are handy when you're working with structures such as uh, what we have here. Um, let me show you how a union works. First of all, to define a union, you use the union keyword, and you define what you want to create as a union. And here I'm going to define my I'm going to have a structure which comprises three floating point numbers. And I want to use a union between this structure and a floating point number such as this, F3, 3. So what does this exactly do? Well, a union is saying that these three variables are the same as this three variables here. The only difference is that these three variables are represented as an array, whereas these three variables have individual names. And we can see this working down below. I've defined our vector to have fx, fy, and fz. And I've displayed it to the screen. But notice also that when I go and type v dot, we also now have f3. f3 here is this guy, uh, this floating point number that I've defined here. This floating point number is actually defined to us using the following notation. You remember this from uh, arrays, which I talked about earlier. So if I go in and uh, let me choose the second one, for instance, and I reset this value to something else, maybe minus 5. And now I go and display this to the screen. Notice what happens. Oh, I've messed something up here. Oh, 
I'm missing a semicolon. Let's try that again. All right. So notice that what I've done here, I've gone through, displayed my values, I've taken the array, the second element of our array, and reset it to minus 5. And it resets here, sure enough. But notice what I've done here. I've actually used Fy to display the second value, not this notation here. It doesn't matter whether I use uh, this notation using the array or the notation of uh, the individual names. Both these variables are actually being represented in the same memory location uh, inside of our program. So what I can do is I can interchange how I use our variables. We can use them either like this, or I can use them as an array. doesn't matter. In memory, they're the exact same thing. So what I can do is I can go and type in f dot fx now and set this guy up to be whatever number I want, let's say 99. And if I want to display these numbers to the screen, I don't have to use uh, fx, fy, fz. I could use my other notation, which is the array notation. Oh, I forgot to increment this guy. And notice that 99 minus 5 and 3 is displayed onto the screen. So that's what a union does. It, it basically joins up this one structure with the next structure, and both of these can, are contained in the same memory space, but you have different ways of accessing them. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to describe in this VMK. Come back for the next one where we'll talk about dynamic memory and pointers.